Live from Bloomer's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan, I'm Matt Miller. And from our studios in Washington, D.C., I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, investors are navigating a sea of uncertainty as the month draws to an end. We're on the hunt for the next big thing with Kate Lawrence of Blockcelerate VC. And what digital assets are safe? Policymakers are weighing in on central bank digital currencies. Yaya Fanusi of the Crypto Council of Innovation will join us with his thoughts. Plus, Goldman's Investor Day is just wrapping up. We'll take a look at the big bank's crypto ambitions. All right, so all of that is ahead. But first, let's get a snapshot of the market. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. That is your function. What you will find is broadly it is an update for digital currencies. Right now, Bitcoin higher by about six-tenths of 1%. We're trading around $23,500. So really, we're not all too much change to end the month from the levels we were at when the month of February began. Ether right now trading at 1644. We're up about 1% on the day. And some of the outperformance is coming from some of those altcoins. Matt, Litecoin up about one percent nine percent as is chain link higher by almost two percent in today's session matt all right so bitcoin has put up some pretty decent gains and actually if you look at this chart you can see that we're looking at back-to-back -back monthly gains however january was a lot stronger than february in fact we could lose it all in one session if something goes wrong the problem is the market is coming to terms with tighter financial conditions and a fed that wants to raise rates and leave them there for longer here's what our market participants had to say about Bitcoin's bounce in the last couple of weeks. An incredibly strong start to the year. Momentum in the crypto space. Performed very robustly. We think we've, we've hit the bottom. What bear market? The next leg up will really be institutional led. Infrastructure uh, building that's happening. Adoption continues to advance. There's a lot to be bullish about and, and therefore a lot that's keeping liquidity uh, in crypto assets. I don't think it will continue. Keeping an eye on what the Fed is doing. The market is not as healthy as people would think. I don't think it's a straight line up from here. All right, well, let's keep following the money and in particular, put the spotlight on venture capital. VC funding for digital asset startups has dramatically declined following a series of crypto scandals. Joining us now from San Francisco is Bloomberg's Hannah Miller to talk more about this. So, Hannah, we know what 2023, uh, 2022 looked like for crypto startups and funding. How's funding shaping up for 2023? While venture capitalists are still very excited about the crypto space, but the pace of deals has definitely slowed. VCs are asking more questions to startup founders. They're upping their due diligence. They are not trying to make the same mistakes that happen when VCs backed FTX. So looking ahead, it won't probably be until summer when venture capital investing in crypto startups picks up. All right, so Hannah, you cover this day in, day out. Um, have, have VCs needs changed? Are they looking in different places now for opportunities than they were, say, pre-FTX? Yeah, so VCs are still excited about crypto infrastructure. They are also now looking more into decentralized finance. With FTX, that was a centralized crypto exchange. So now they're kind of turning to decentralized finance platforms that don't have an intermediary, that it's peer to peer. So the other thing, too, that they're looking at is blockchain gaming, as well as the intersection of crypto and artificial intelligence. AI is hot everywhere, including in crypto. Yeah, AI is a very big deal across the spectrum. Hannah, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Hannah Miller covers crypto and VCs for us out of San Francisco. Joining us now is Kate Lawrence, founder and CEO of Blockcelerate VC. And Kate, let me just get you to confirm, you know, Hannah's reporting there. What are you looking at? What do you find interesting right now um, post the implosion of FTX and kind of centralized crypto? You know, Matt, I am seeing a lot of excitement around real world assets. Last year, the investors got overly excited with unrealistic yields that uh, volatile assets were producing. So this year, everybody is a lot more grounded. Real world assets are picking up and we have a couple of portfolio companies that are doing really well in that Realm, Centrifuge, uh, Block Apps, among others. We're seeing a lot of infrastructure. If you think about uh, 1999 internet uh, days, a lot of infrastructure had to be built in order for the next wave of internet users to come to market. And we're seeing the same wave of infrastructure 
build out happening in crypto. Okay, so maybe there are opportunities to invest, but when you do so, how do you think about valuing these companies, considering valuations across all kinds of new speculative areas of technology have come down substantially uh, over the last 12 months plus? Absolutely, and I think it's a great thing for the industry. What we've seen over the last couple of years was unsustainable. Uh, there was a lot of chase for deals at unsustainable valuations. Now founders are a lot more grounded when they ask for money. And we are fundamental investors, so we are looking at the fundamentals, such as revenues, adoption, customer numbers, and that's the metrics that we use in order to invest. And when you do invest, what kind of exit ultimately are you looking for? Are you looking for these to be self-sustaining businesses, or are you looking for them to be acquired or, or go public or another kind, considering that public markets are likely not to be all too friendly to companies in this area, yeah. as well as any kind of traditional financial players who would maybe be interested in acquiring a crypto asset may also have a bad taste in their mouth, given the implosion of FTX that we were just talking about. You know, we are long-term investors. We're not worried about these short-term swings. And in the long term, good businesses will generate revenue. If you generate revenue, you have plenty of options to exit whether that M&A or going public or whether you're going to do it through a token offering. So as long as you're investing in the fundamentals, it doesn't really matter. You are uh, one of only a, a few dozen um, you know, blockchain VCs or Web3 focused VCs that have launched a second fund. How, how is fundraising right now? What's the appetite among investors to continue to put money into this space? You know, the fundraising appetite has picked up significantly this year. Um, as you would expect, last year was absolutely brutal for everyone in crypto. And the focus of the conversation has been primarily on speculation versus innovation. I'm seeing a lot more interest in the innovation that this technology brings. So the appetite has picked up significantly. We also see, um, you know, we, I just uh, heard a story from Caroline Hepker out of London highlighting the fact that in the UK, only 12% of traditional finance fund managers are women, which is a dismal figure. Um, but it looks like it's even worse in the crypto space. Out of 155 uh, Web3 focused VCs, only five are run or co run by women. That's 3% and change, Kate. Why is it so bad? It is really a shame. I'm very proud to represent the females in this industry, but I have to say it starts from the top. Even if I look at my investor base, only one out of 60 investors that I have in the fund is female. So I think there's a long way for us to go in order to bring um, equality. We are doing everything we can to see every single female run crypto company that we can. But even in the last two years, we looked at 3,000 companies and we only maybe spoke with 10, 15 female founded startups. So that just gives you an idea of how, um, how long of a wait we have to go here. Okay, so if there's a lot of work left to be done there, that is only one area in which there still seems to be a lot of work yet to be done. And another one, considering you and I are here in Washington, is on the regulatory front. We have a lot of conversations on this show about how a lack of regulatory clarity can stifle innovation because companies are reluctant to try new things or launch different products when they don't know what they could get slapped with uh, with an enforcement action, for example. How do you navigate that when you are making investments? And how do you advise the founders you work with to be navigating this? uncertainty. We are encouraging all of our founders to be as compliant as we can get them to be. With that said, what's been happening over the last couple of uh, months is that a lot of regulatory attention went to the good players, the centralized players based here in the U.S. who are already trying to do their best to comply with regulations. So what I'd like to see is regulation that's clear and that's not driving innovation outside of the United States, because ultimately this technology is about decentralization. Mm -hmm. So the more we can empower people to participate in this economy and to own this piece of the new Internet, the better economically we're all going to be. Well, you mentioned they're driving innovation outside of the U.S. I mean, how many companies that you work with or have looked at have said, hey, we're not even going to mess with this. We're going to take our business and be central centralized elsewhere yeah. in order to avoid the this uncertainty here. I mean, how much of that goes on? 
You know, we are a U.S.-based fund. Most of our investments are here in the U.S., and we're fighting the fight, and so are our portfolio companies. We believe in this country, and we think the innovation is here to stay. So I would say most of them are still here, and I hope it's going to stay this way. All right. Well, it was great to have you here in the U.S., in Washington, D.C., with us in our studio. Thank, Thank you, you so much me. for our time. That was Kate Lawrence of Block Accelerate VC. Now, coming up, we'll speak with an expert on central bank digital currencies. Yaya Fanusi from the Crypto Council for Innovation will join us. And Goldman's blockchain push, why the bank may be investing more into its digital asset team. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Our first objective is to differentiate between central bank digital currencies that are backed by the state and publicly issued crypto assets and stable coins. Stable coins that are backed, they create a reasonably good space for the economy. Crypto assets that are not backed, they are speculative. This is a high risk investment and not money. That was Kristalina Gorgieva, IMF Managing Director, speaking over the weekend at the G20 Finance Minister's meeting on the differences between private cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies. Joining us now on that subject is an expert, Yaya Fanusi. He is an expert on CBDCs. He was director at the Crypto Council for Innovation and a fellow at the Center for New American Security. There is so much we want to talk to him about, but first let's just start with the CBDC question. Where are we on that here in the U.S., and how far out front is China? Well, the U.S. is, is I think, sort of on the sidelines, doing some good work, doing research. But if you think about the rest of the world, China is actually leading the way. China has been working on a pilot since 2014, uh, working on its central bank digital currency, has already sort of had millions of transactions, millions of wallets, and has an array of pilots that are in the hands of people testing out smart contracts and programmability of money. So they actually have data that they're iterating on and they're helping other countries uh, with standards and collaborating on CBDC to CBDC transactions. So I'd say we're behind, although it doesn't mean that it's a race where we have to do exactly what China's doing, but the conversation globally is happening and China, and, and China is well positioned to influence that conversation. How concerning is that from a security perspective perspective, given your background on that and on counterterrorism and some of these other issues, you have special insight into this. Yes, and I think the, the the backdrop to this is that there's really a geopolitical context to all of this, and we have to make sure that we're not losing the forest for the trees. The geopolitical backdrop is that around the world there is now I don't know if it's a race, but there's certainly a march towards finding alternative ways for new digital financial infrastructure, basically how to do cross-border transactions uh, in a way where you're not relying the same way on traditional banking infrastructure. That's happening, whether we want to like it or not. And it's not just China. Uh, of course, China has its project, but other countries in the EU, the UK, Japan, uh, other parts of East Asia are all trying to figure out a way to innovate with payments. Now, the geopolitical implications there is, if there is an alternative uh, financial infrastructure, if there are new rails and the U.S. doesn't have the same influence on that, it is not sort of at the, at the table when new standards are being laid, then that impacts U.S. state economic statecraft. Sanctions, the ability to sanctions, the potency of, of our sanctions power comes from the centrality of, U, of the U.S. to the financial global infrastructure. So if that shifts, even if it shifts a little bit, doesn't mean that China is going to take over or, or that the U.S is going to uh, displace the dollar. But if there's a viable new uh, rail where mm. sanctioned actors can now transact, that, 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 that's trouble. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah, you're not only interesting to us because um, you're on the Crypto Council for Innovation, but also because you used to work for the Central Intelligence Agency, which gives you some insight into what the government is thinking about these new technologies. Um, 
do you think the CIA, do you think the Biden administration, uh, Congress, are they all aware of the potential disruptions it could cause if China gets too far ahead of us in this space and we're lagging behind? I would say yes, generally. And this, of course, is you know, from public statements, from what the Biden administration put out in executive order, obviously is looking at the future of payments, the future of, of digital payments. That's all there. What I think is maybe missing is that the posture is more defensive than offensive, right? I mean, if, if there are concerns about China leading, if there are concerns about the U.S., uh, 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 of, of there being an alternative, it can't be met with just a defensive posture against maybe some of the risks that this could propose. It has to be met with, really, a vision of what does the digital uh, future look like for the United States? What should be the rules? What should be the standards? And I would probably say that uh, there's probably too much of a focus on immediately where crypto mm. assets are. Now, obviously, there's, you know, there are scams out there. There are a lot of issues. We could look at that. But th that's why I say we have to look at the forest, not just the trees. Yeah. The trees are a few ruined, <laughs> there are a few, lots of ruined, <laughs> uh, rotten trunks out there. But the forest Forest is what's happening writ large around digital asset innovation. Right. As Tom Keen would say, you want to be where the puck is going. Um, although I don't really understand hockey that well. Uh, what do you think about the need for a CBDC? Um, do we have to have a central bank digital currency, or are we okay with the stable coins that we've already got pegged to the U.S. dollar? I don't have a specific answer, and I think what where the U.S. is and what the U.S. has to think about is what are the re what are the the tools that are out there that are going to be important? What is the infrastructure? What's the technolo the technology that may be useful? Now, the march towards a CBDC, if you think about it, is really a it is a government-focused route. It is saying, hey, let's build these government rails. Um, now, what will be built upon that? I don't think we really know. I think the one thing that, that I would encourage from my sort of looking at this as a research area is that we need to consider that there's going to have to be flexibility and adaptability for mm. the digital, for, for digital financial infrastructure. Now, does that mean we rely on government? Hey, again, that's a question I think uh, people are going to have to think about. But we're going to have to, I think... Um, leverage some of these new technologies that are being innovated upon. I mean, if you think about a CBDC, and one big concern a lot of people has have is the question of privacy. Yeah. If you're gonna if you're gonna build a, a something where data is captured, the Chinese model is okay. Yeah, the, the government will collect it, and the government will you know unmask those identities and and potentially exploit them. We before even going towards a CBDC in the U.S., we have to have a conversation about how do we protect privacy. What is the digital financial privacy? posture, I don't think we even have that yet. There's also privacy and then there's also security when it comes to criminal behavior as well. You mentioned economic statecraft earlier. The idea that we hear often about in criticism of crypto assets is sanctions evasion, uh, terrorist financing, all sorts of illicit activity. And I'm wondering, given your background in counterterrorism, how much of that you really see happening still? And frankly, how that compares to illicit activity conducted in fiat currency? Yeah, I've been actually looking at terrorist financing and some of these other illicit methodologies with crypto for, for years now. And the thing I would say is it's interesting. The terrorist use of crypto and, and some of these other illicit actors, their adoption sort of mirrors the general adoption uh, that you see uh, in the general in the public. <clears throat> so as these actors sort of figure out, oh, here's a new tool, you're going to see them exploit it. I'd say that that is now sort of another tool in the toolkit of illicit uh, transactions. The thing is, it's not so much how much they're using it. It's about, again, maybe the hockey puck example, getting to the puck before the illicit actors do. The thing is, illicit actors don't just stay with one you know, crypto method or one financial method. They're, they're always looking to adapt. Mm -hmm. And so the key is, how are we positioned? How are anti-money you know, anti laundering officials, how are terrorist, you know, counter-terrorist officials, how are they thinking and preparing for innovation in the world of finance and technology? All right, Yaya, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us. Super interesting and insightful stuff. That's Yaya Fanuzi of the Crypto Council for Innovation. We appreciate your time. And thanks for joining us here in Washington. Meanwhile, here in Washington, we do also have some breaking news to mention from the White House. President Biden is nominating Julie Sue for Labor Secretary, of course, a position that will be vacated uh, by Marty Walsh. The president just putting out a statement about his intent to nominate her, saying that she has spent her life fighting to make sure that everyone has a fair shot, no community is overlooked, and no worker is left behind. Again, President Biden nominating Julie Sue for Labor Secretary. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller in New York City with Kaylee Lines in Washington. Let's get to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week. First off, the SEC is probing Robinhood's crypto business. According to the brokerage, the subpoena was received in December of last year. That's just after the crypto exchange FTX filed for bankruptcy, spurring a wave of regulatory action. And Visa and MasterCard are planning on deferring the launch of some crypto products and services. According to Reuters, the pay payments processors are waiting until market conditions and the regulatory environment improve. And Goldman Sachs is leaning in to blockchain. The company's digital asset team signaled it is open to bolstering staff and flagged the potential for blockchain technology to improve the functioning of markets such as private equity. Last week, Goldman's tokenization platform, GSDAP, was used to sell bonds in Hong Kong. All right, and Matt, we do have some more breaking news to bring our audience. The CFTC has filed fraud allegations against former FTX official Nishad Singh. He, of course, is the former head of engineering at FTX, the now defunct crypto exchange. And Matt, this news out of regulators here in the U.S., which would be civil charges, is after we got news earlier today that Singh also had pled guilty to criminal charges here in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not sure how the criminal case would affect a civil suit. But if you've already pled guilty in one court, it would make sense um, that you're going to plead guilty in another. Uh, he's got a deal, it seems like, with the DOJ for his testimony. And the question is, does that carry it over to the CFT suit in terms of giving him leniency, the kind that we would expect to keep him out of jail for a longer period of time in exchange for his testimony? Yeah, very good point. And of course, we've already seen other former FTX and Alameda officials cooperating with prosecutors as well. So, of course, a story that continues to evolve. Again, the CFTC filing fraud allegations against Nishad Singh. So we will stay on top of that story for you today and, of course, through the rest of the week and always right here on Bloomberg Crypto. Matt. More Bloomberg Crypto uh, next week, Tuesday at 1 p.m. again with Kaylee out of D.C. and me in New York. This is Bloomberg.